Well, hello, welcome. Welcome, I'm glad you made it after three pretty intensive conference days, I guess. <clears throat> My son, who you might have seen during the last days, actually wanted to play something like da-da-da-da when I start my presentation, but I said, no, maybe not. Um, so I'm glad you're here. Actually, it would be just half the fun without you. Um, just to answer one question before I start, I didn't write the book which I'm present, presenting here. That's a couple of participants asked that, and it's the book over there which uh, Tomke has. Um, I didn't write it, I'm presenting it because I think it's a, uh, it's really a fascinating approach to planning a deportation. The book's from 2008. Uh, yes, I do. Uh, I, I worked a couple of times with the author, with Steve, and that's why I think I'm uh, quite familiar with it. And I also think it could use some publicity. So that's why I'm here, that's why I'm uh, talking about it, and that's why I'm selling those copies. Um, <clears throat> as far as uh, myself, uh, for me, interpretation started back in the late 80s when, um, when I started my studies in ecology and geography, and I also worked as a seasonal nature guide in the Wadensee National Park in Germany. Especially the experience as a nature guide in this national park <clears throat> made me think, how can we do this better? Because at that time and still today, in a lot of places, there is no real training. You just, you just do it. You go out there, you read a little bit, you join one or two trips with another guide, and then you're out there um, <clears throat> doing the guided tour. No communication training. In the Wadden Sea, also especially no security training, which I had the experience could be pretty crucial. So it really made me think, how can you improve this? And so I thought, okay, national parks, they are from, uh, the ideas from the States, so I just go there. So I went there a couple of times, checked out uh, the national parks, and surprise, surprise, I came across environmental interpretation and the NAI. So that was really interested, and that what made me uh, start working in this field. Uh, after my studies, I did my PhD on planning process, interpretive planning processes in German national parks, and guess what? There are no planning processes. It's just done. Uh, so that was in the late 90s, and I have to say that you might know Thorsten Ludwig, who had a presentation today too. He's working very uh, much more than we do with protected areas in Germany. So there are some developments. We're working at the moment, especially for wildlife parks and interpretation. And um, there are developments, but I think Thorsten would agree that uh, we still have a long way to go. So today I'm a freelancer since uh, almost 10 years. And as I said, I'm especially interested in this approach from Stefan Mader. And I think what's very interesting is that interpretive design tries to close the gap, um, which is quite usually left behind when sites uh, only work with architects or graphic designers, filmmakers, actors, and so forth. So the idea of how to really engage uh, the uh, the people who come in leisure time is not so widespread. I think that goes for a number of other countries as well. What makes interpretive design stand out as well is uh, that it considers the whole visitation process of, um, of the visitor in a very deep and a very broad sense. Uh, due to the limited time here, I will give you a Al Condor Pasa style presentation that summarizes uh, the basics. First of all, Steve talks about the interpretive sphere, which is about the visitor and a place or a site. So the visitor, the visitor um, needs are analyzed carefully in this book as a foundation for uh, successful target group oriented planning processes. These are basically 
in this book outlined as information, uh, the wish to get a feeling for a site that's visited, and physical or psychological um, stimulation or animation. Now, this is the uh, interpretive sphere, as uh, the author calls it, uh, the interface between the visitor and the place. <clears throat> and beside, uh, there's something that I think is also very interesting, and that is that the author analyzes how to identify what I would call high-quality content. High-quality content. So you, you've all heard of and read about uh, from authors, um, various authors who talk about a sense of place, a character, the character of a place, the genius Loki, how it's called sometimes, or that we should interpret a whole. Um, I think Steve takes this a little further by suggesting a framework how to really identify those um, meaningful contents. Uh, basically, he does this by saying uh, nothing exists by itself, but by th because of three three points. One is that everything exists because of cultural and natural processes, which needs to be identified. Everything exists because of various essences, essences that make it up. And the third is everything exists, and that's, I think, pretty interesting, because of our perception of things. I will give you an example here. <clears throat> Okay, this shouldn't be here now, so you don't see this, right? Actually, you would only see this green spot, and I guess none of you would be able to say what it is, which is only natural, because this is a little uh, visual game. Nothing exists by itself, but as soon as you get a, a map for it, and if you would now read this, you would better get a better clue and see, okay, this, uh, this is a biosphere reserve, it's in the Thuringia Mountains in Germany, and so forth. What we did together with the client, we analyzed the essences, the processes, and the perception that are especially important for this site. And in the end, we came out with these. So the essences that really make up this particular mountain area, this biosphere reserve, are various uh, habitats, which you can see here. Then several specific processes, geological processes, which ended up in climatic processes, that again were the prerequisites for several economic processes, like mining, agriculture, and tourism. The perception was especially very most important for the client because they are kind of a stranger it is competing with the surrounding nature park which is a little brighter green here so they don't like each other too much in germany nobody understands what a biosphere reserve is so they said we need to put full energy into making people aware that this is a biosphere reserve not a nature park and what what is a biosphere reserve that it has an international uh, meaning. So it's a UNESCO Biosphere Reserve. Um, that was very important to them. Now, how do we, how do we convey, convey this uh, content comprehensively uh, into an experience that catches the whole, uh, the whole visitor? There are various ideas on how to do this. There is no finished structure or finished plan, but um, the author is very much uh, very empathetic about the idea of what makes a strong experience. Usually this whole presentation would last one and a half or two days, so as I said, it's pretty brief, but you might buy one of the last books over there later on. So what Steve does as a core planning uh, step is he would take those um, features here, the essences, the processes, and the perception, the contents, and put it into an interpretive 
so-called interpretive matrix that consists of head, heart, hand, and hunger, which means that in this column you would find what, in this example that he developed for the book, what he considers to be most important for, in this case, the Everglades. I guess you've all heard about Everglades or been there. Um, so what should people, could, should people take, a vo take away in this with regard um, to this interpretive matrix? What should they maybe feel about this place? And this is one very ex uh, interesting point because uh, the heart component, the feeling component, if I work with clients, uh, and I hope this is not specific, specific German, it's really hard to talk about feelings. So ask somebody from a national park or maybe from the British Museum, what do you want people to feel when they're in this place? And then later on, how do we um, do this in terms of an experience for the visitor? Also, the hands part, there are some examples here of what he would like people to do or take away. And in the end, the hunger, the stomach part, that's one of the numerous clever ideas in this approach. Um, he has a lot of techniques which you can use without the, uh, the overall planning process. And one of those is that uh, <clears throat> he analyzes the visitor's needs, and in the pl planning process he says, that's what everybody wants, so we should really make sure, as much as possible, that we include this in our planning. Um, just to give you one example, Traubenzucker, uh, what heißt das? Fruit sugar. Fruit sugar? Glucosis. Fruit sugar, glucosis, are you familiar with that? No? Okay. I'll give you another example. I, I wanted to tell you an example from, uh, from uh, our own work, but here is something I thought it's really clever. I just found this lately on a trade show uh, from, from uh, construction companies. A trade show from construction companies. They had this little box that resembles the bricks they are selling. And this is a special innovative new brick with insulation inside. So what they did now during this trade show, they had a popcorn uh, selling, you know? So they would fill this with popcorn. Their message is on the outside, the, uh, the, um, the picture. And it's really so close to what they are doing because popcorn is a great insulation. It's warm. Um, people like it. And you would smell it from far away. So that's really a good example, I think, for what you can do in terms of the hunger um, component. David, you had an example from, Whale, from Wales today from Conway, I think, where they have these tables and print in a, uh, a cultural heritage site and printed on the table was the food people used to eat in former days, right? So there are lots and lots of um, options out there to use this component to convey our messages and our content. Uh, there are examples there, but usually it's not um, really on our mind, I think. So just to give you here one example, you would consider this, this should be part of one experience. How to do the experience from that is then the next step, but he would go on and say, people should un underst get an understanding that the Everglades are a vast, seasonally flooded marsh. I'm reading this out because I guess you can read from back there. The hard component is People should get a feeling that it's a quiet, watery landscape of reflective beauty and moods. In the hands, he says, uh, they might get an illustrative, environmentally friendly site memento with a gateway message. And the hunger here, 
a nutritious, organic, site-specific drink or dish that expresses some essence of the place. If you have such a matrix, uh, the nice thing about it is that you can give this to the architect, the graphic designer, the filmmaker, you name it, and say, OK, whatever you do, but we want this to show up when you do it, OK? If your countries are like Germany, and in this case, I think they are, I think so, in most cases, we are usually hired when the architect's out of the door. So we come in, and then the client says, OK, here are the binders with the architectural drawings. Now, what do we do? You know? And if the architect would get an input beforehand with such an interpretive matrix, I guess it would make a world of difference. In terms of the experience, Steve summarized it at some point, saying interpretation is not so much about experience explained, but about expl as explanation experienced. So somebody else once said, might be a little easier, experience is not what happens to you, but what you do with what happens to you. So the doing is really, really uh, crucial here. Um, da, da, da. Okay, now that's, that's the interpretive sphere, and now we are in the pl planning process. As I said, it's the whole visitor um, visitation cycle, and it starts from the arrival. Usually, the author says, um, interpretation starts at the parking lot, okay? Uh, which means that we, we need to have a real good welcome and a good orientation. And you're probably very familiar with the problems that, are, uh, that we have in the context of orientation, especially. Mm. Arrival, so the guests there. And then Steve describes what makes a strong message. And without going into details about his su su suggestions on messages, um, the, bo the book luckily also offers a concrete example for the conference th theme, heritage interpretation and citizenship. <clears throat> and this ex example is from Colonial Williamsburg in the USA. So Steve, in this book, he has numerous examples, analyzes, which he did on almost every continent in the world. And he describes the situation, and then, based on his ideas on interpretive design, gives um, suggestions how this could be improved, if you agree with his ideas on interpretive design. Colonial Williamsburg in the USA is a former capital of Virginia and the initial English colony in America. So it was a very culturally, from, in terms of the cultural heritage, it's really important. And so he, um, he had chosen that. Right now, the, the message is Colonial Williamsburg, that the future may learn from the past. I'm not American, I haven't been there, but I, doubt to, uh, I, I dare to say that this is so general that it fits to almost every cultural heritage site. What he suggests here is Colonial Williamsburg, where you can walk the uneven road of American democracy. I would like to hear from, from Americans afterwards, if there's somebody here, um, what you think about it. He, owned, uh, he describes this in much more length, but um, uh, at this point, I would leave it, like to leave it at that. Uh, on site, uh, the planning is also about how to factor in the image of an organization, and it's also about how to organize, how to organize uh, the content. Organization, actually, as we know, is as crucial as the message. Sam Ham in his book uh, uh, described that. But uh, from my experience, at least, it seems that it's not very common to come up with strong organizers, which are basically there to help our participants remember what they've seen, heard, and experienced. And Steve gives, gives very concrete examples on how to organize content, for example, via songs 
acronyms, poetry, stories, etc. Could be rather complex, could be very easy. Um, right. Oh, I forgot the technique. At the end, at the end, he says, we should really boil it all down and then think about how to convey the content that we have analyzed here. And usually, as you probably know too, usually it's, uh, a site says, okay, we want a, uh, a visitor center, we want a self-guided trail, a brochure, or whatever, instead of thinking first, what do we want to convey? The departure part, the farewell, should be as nice and warm as the welcome. And he also suggests to do some thorough evaluation and give some suggestions, not too much, but some suggestions on how to do this. So I think I'm pretty much done time-wise, yeah? Is that correct? Yes. One, I, ah, I want to be a nice speaker. So, okay. Basically, I'm through. I could give you some more example maybe on the hunger component if you like. Or